All right. So if you see what Professor Zimmerman talked about today is exactly what you have to do in this project number six, just a little bit simpler. Uh, first of all, you have data for a given rock. You know at uh, what stress is going to fail. And according to those stresses, you need to calculate for a deviated wellbore at any possible inclination and azimuth what is going to be the pressure in the wellbore that is going to get to that shear failure or tensile failure. And, and that's what he showed today, but he showed that with an extension to anisotropic media elastically and also anisotropic in terms of view of the strength. So there, there are two levels of uh, anisotropy that he took into account. And he, he showed that these very symmetric surfaces that we see right here, so th these are all surface plots, they are not as symmetric when you consider an anisotropic rock and that they can get uh, quite a bit more complex. But if you follow the, the workflow that you're going to follow, starting from here, going through the deviated well wall, and in, instead of, say, using an, an isotropic solution as you're going to use with the Kirsch equation, you use his other equation, and instead of using a, a, an isotropic st strength criterion, shear failure criterion, you use an, an isotropic criterion, and later you put all of that into a code that computes that at any inclination and at any deviation, you'll be able to create this. Okay, so I think there is just one more thing I'd like to do before we get into talking about these deviated well balls. Because I want to finish with a part of the failure criteria uh, so, so that would be, for example, over here, talking about Drucker Prager, talking about modify lathe, which is not in here, but it's in the next one. And as, as soon as we finish that, then we'll go into the wellbore analysis. And if we finish that, we'll talk into about the theory of plasticity, which goes beyond what it is in here. Okay, okay. One more thing I want to mention about Professor Zimmerman's talk is that in these experiments that that we have right here, and I also gave you data for these are these all are axisymmetric triaxial tests. And what that means, is that the minimum principal stress is equal to the least principal stress. In real rocks, in real environments, that's not going to be the case most of the time. Sigma two is going to be different than sigma three. So what Professor Zimmerman showed today is that when you account for that, these failure criteria also are going to be slightly different. And in order to do those tests, instead of using this type of axisymmetric triaxial test, what you do is what is called a polyaxial test in which instead of testing a cylinder, you test a cube or a prism with a cuboidal shape. But that uh, you can apply stresses which are different in three directions, sigma two, sigma three, and sigma one. And those kind of experiments are a little bit more difficult to do. That's why they are not uh, out there everywhere. But they can be done, and you can find data about those in the, in the literature. All right, so let's see where we are. We talk about this test, uh, and uh, there is uh, one more thing we have to do is that after we talked about the Moore-Coulomb criterion, 
we would like to take into account now that Molecular criterion into the into three dimensions. So so far we talked just in one dimension, and now we're going to talk in three dimensions. So we're going to get back from one line to a failure surface. Let's see how that looks. Okay, this plot might not be um, very easy to do, but uh, I'll try that anyways. Probably I'll not, I will not do it for all the criteria that we want to. So this is, I'm, I'm drawing the principal stress space. And if you remember here, uh, we had the line of isotropic stresses. And around that line, if we have a dracker prager criterion, it looks like a cone symmetric with respect to that axis. Sigma 1 equal to sigma 2 equal to sigma 3. Okay, everyone remembers that. Another thing that Professor Zimmerman talked about is about the octahedral shear stress and the octahedral mean stress. And what that means is that in these type of plots, you can take a look at what is called the octahedral stress, which is go just going to be the deviatoric stress, sigma 1 minus sigma 3. And the octahedral principal stress is just going to be the mean stress that we have been using all the time. But it's the same thing. It's just dividing the state of stress into a state of stress which is isotropic. And if you're going to go anywhere along this circle, uh, that's that will be the octahedral shear stress. OK, so we're going to do one thing here in order to simplify this plot. And this is going to be to look as if we were, so that this is supposed to be an, an eye, OK? We're going to look in the direction of the hydrostatic axis. So if we look exactly in the direction of the hydrostatic axis, if we sit here in infinity, in the direction of the hydrostatic axis, and we look towards the origin, we're going to see something like this. Again, this is the hydrostatic axis. This is sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. It's a three-dimensional space, but, but we cannot see variations in the hydrostatic axis because it's from an in, uh, a distance which is quite far away. All right, the purpose of this kind of plot is to eliminate the mean stress because here we don't see mean stress. We just know that if a point is in here, that's a mean stress uh, or that's a the, yeah, that's a mean stress, and it's an isotropic state of stress, but we don't know what the value is. We know it's isotropic, but we don't know what the value is. And when you do that, it gets very handy because the only thing that you see is the deviatoric stress. And for example, for a, a dracker prager criterion, this is going to be a perfect circle. Let's see somewhere. It's going to be something like this. It's very difficult to draw circles. Uh, oh, that's too bad. Let's give me one more try. I'm very picky about 
around my circle. Okay, that's, um, let me fix this and then. All right, so that would be this circle at some mean stress. We know with Drucker Prager, the radius of the circle varies according to where you are in this axis. And remember, this is going to be the failure surface. Okay. We used the Drucker Prager criterion because we said that it was an evolution with respect to the Tresca criterion because it had those uh, sharp edges. Uh, but then later, uh, we came uh, we came about talking about this new failure criterion, which is the Moore Coulomb failure criterion. And for the Moore Coulomb failure criterion, if we want to look at the shape of it in this type of a space, it's going to be different than the circle, of course, and it's going to be different than Tresca two. And we're going to have two cases triaxial compression and for triaxial compression we're going to have that sigma 2 is equal to sigma 3 and those two are going to be uh, sorry I'm going to be smaller than sigma 1 where this is the maximum principal stress and these two are the same and basically this is the test in which your radial stresses are the same and you're pushing in axial direction. That is called an axial compression. And the maximum value that you can get to is going to be the same either if you go in this direction, in this direction, or in that direction. So Remember, the center is sigma 3 equal to sigma 2 equal to sigma 1. So if I get off the center just along one of these axes, the other two are going to be the same, but there's just going to be one which is going to be different than the other two. So these are what are called triaxial compression paths, and that's going to be the maximum value. But there's going to be another case, which is called triaxial extension. And in triaxial extension, let me add one more thing over here. Typically, in a triaxial test, this will be the confining pressure. In the triaxial extension case, it's going to be different. In the triaxial extension, sigma 3 is going to be smaller than sigma 1 and sigma 1 is going to be equal to sigma 2. So the first case is you have a constant confining pressure and then you add axial stress. The second case you could do it also in, in axis symmetric compression by having a constant axial stress and adding more confining pressure until it fails. That is what, that's what is called triaxial compression because the first one, when you push down, it will shorten. The second one, when you push from the sides, it will extend until it fails. Okay. But now, in this space, it's going to be in a different place. So the minimum principal stress is going to stay here at the center, but then the two other stresses are going to change at the same time. So for example, let's change this three Roman and two Roman the same value, and this is going to be a line that is going to fall 
somewhere over here. If I go change sigma 3 and sigma 1 simultaneously, this is going to be somewhere over here. And if I do that in this direction, it's going to be somewhere over there. Well, it turns out that when you put these equations into the more Coulomb failure criterion, uh, we're not going to do that because that's going to take us a long time. Uh, but I'll, uh, you can do it at home. I'll, I'll ask you to believe me just for now. The maximum value of sigma 1 equal to sigma 2 is not going to be this length, but it's going to fall a little bit shorter of that. And it's going to be, let me first do it with, with pencil so I make sure that it turns out OK. It's going to be a little bit less than what, than what you had before. And OK, that, that, uh, let me finish this. OK, yeah, that looks pretty good to me. It's going to be this. And these are going to be the triaxial extension parts. The shape of that, it's different, and it's different in this direction because here, uh, all what Mohr Coulomb cares about is about the difference between sigma 1 and sigma 3, and takes isotropic stress, or it takes mean stress, also taking into account sigma 2. Uh, and that's why these uh, distances are different in triaxial extension than in triaxial compression. At the end of the day, instead of getting this nice and symmetric hexagon like we were getting bef before with Tresca, we get this, sh this hexagon with a shape which is not symmetric with respect to every axis. And it looks something like this. So this is more Coulomb, or also, I also agree with Professor Zimmerman, this is not called more Coulomb, actually. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, this is Drucker Prager. Uh, this is Drucker Prager, it's called Drucker Prager. This one is usually called more Coulomb, but uh, as a matter of fact, it's just the Coulomb failure criterion. More didn't came up with this criterion, it was Coulomb. It's just that when you plot it, you plot it with more circles, and it's more convenient to do it like that. It's actually Coulomb failure criterion. All right. Do you think there is any problem with this now new failure surface that we have? You remember what we said about the Tresca criterion? Why we went from Tresca to more Coulomb? because of the shape and because it has these sharp points with two derivatives that are not friendly to mathematicians and are not friendly to any numerical code, anything. So there is a solution to this more Coulomb criterion, which is a smooth curve. And it looks something like this. I'm going to try to do my best in order to do this. This goes around the Mohr Coulomb failure criterion, but it is smooth and derivable. And this is what is called the lathe criterion. And we're not going to go into the, all the equations about how to derive that, but I'm just going to, to write it over here. And we're going to write another version of that, which is more applicable to, to rock mechanics, and it's called the modified lay criterion, in which basically 
this is going to be a function of the first invariant of the stress tensor and the third invariant of the stress tensor equal to a constant. Uh, that, that's basically it. So in, in here we have the three stresses and in here too. Uh, do you remember, um, well I think I'm, I'm going to write that so I don't have to write it right now. Um, let me write the actual modified lake criterion. So th this is basically the idea, okay? Now let me write it how it, it exactly is. It's going to be the it's going to be as we said the function of this invariance, but now there is a star there. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what the star is. This is the equation. And the first one is equal to uh, a definition of, no, 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 this is plus. It's just the first invariant of these sigma stars third invariant is the determinant of the matrix and when you have a, a principal stress matrix or tensor is just going to be the product of the elements in the diagonal and finally this is going to be uh, related to each sigma star equal to the actual sigma, where sigma will mean effective stress always, plus this parameter S, where S is equal to cohesive strength, is sort of a mm, cohesive strength, but a little bit different to what we have been using so far tangent of the friction angle and the parameter eta depends on the friction properties of the rock and is equal to this. I'm sorry, that's a square. All right, so that's going to be a modified lake criterion. And when you put this into uh, your failure surface in the octahedral plane or on the shear plane, the diatonic plane, it's going to look like this. And in three dimensions, I'm not going to attempt to, to draw that, but, but you could imagine how that looks. Let's see a few images uh, so you get an idea about these failure surfaces. And we'll talk about the one that Professor Seaman talked about uh, today. So in three dimensions, let me try with yield surface. I think we're going to have better results. Okay, let's try to find a good image. So here is in three dimensions. Tresca, bomb misses around, and th those are relatively simple. Let me find another, another one a little bit more complex. Okay, here, now we have Drucker Prager, so it's a cone. And let's try to find Okay, this is the one that we're going to see later on. This one, it starts like a cone, but then finishes at some point. What does that mean? So the ones we have been seeing so far, for example, this one over here, it, I'm not drawing it here, but it's implied that 
that cone will continue forever and will get bigger forever. This one, no. This one is limited. So what do you think would that mean? Let me give you a hint. This point is on the isotropic axis. Don't think too much in, uh, in terms of rock failure, but rather than rock yield. And what that means, rock yield, is that you leave the elastic domain and you go into permanent deformations. So what do you think that point is going to be? So, okay, what, what is so high then? The all of them. All of them. You agree with that, yeah. Exactly. That's the point. This is the point at which your stresses are so high that you start breaking the grains, you start collapsing the pores. And there is a limit for that. In real materials, there is going to be a limit. And when you transition from this point to that line, there is going to be a surface that covers that response. And that's what we're going to get into uh, after we finish with, with this topic. But in summary, and probably uh, I, I want to show one, one more thing, but, uh, but just keep in mind this. This is what we're, we're getting to. This is a cross-section of that failure surface, uh, but with the, with the axis, with some other convention, but it's basically the same thing. So shear compression, and here a mix of shear with compression, and here tension. Okay, what I wanted to show is, uh, let's see if we can find a good image of that. what is this muggy Coulomb surface and how that is different from what we have been talking before. There's one example over there. Let me see if I find a better image. Okay, I think this one is good. Okay, here again, we have the more Coulomb failure surface. Here, another more Coulomb failure surface. And here we have the, this muggy Coulomb in which now the sides of that surface, they are not straight, but now they are a little bit curved. And when you look from the hydrostatic axis on the octahedral plane, it looks like this sort of uh, uh, treble-like uh, shape. And that's a Moggy Coulomb failure criterion. So it takes in into account that additional complexity. When you go into anisotropic rocks, it gets even more complicated. And uh, if you are interested in that area, you should definitely read this paper that Professor Zimmerman was talking about today that he authored. But at the end of the day, just to, to keep it simple, any failure surface is going to be delimited by more or less three uh, bounds. And we're going to simplify this to an an isotropic material and we're going to simplify it too instead of working in the principal state uh, axis we're going to work on the J2 I1 axis or, or uh, space remember 
this one is mean stress sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3 divided by 3 uh, no I'm sorry just sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3 that's that's the first invariant and here we have the square root of the invariant of the deviatoric stress tensor which is I, I don't remember very well the equation but, uh, but you, you remember it's a, it's a long equation and it's basically proportional to the differences between the principal stresses all right so so far we have seen mostly just shear lines and these shear lines are going to delimit the possible state of stress in terms of shear failure or shear yield for geomaterials which are stress sensitive the higher the mean stress the higher the deviatoric stress they can support but there is a problem with this line and the problem is that usually if you were to assume this shear line you will have a very high tensile strength which will be the, the intercept between this and that line which is not realistic and because of that in, a, in addition to this line we need another line which could be simply a vertical line and that is going to be the value of the tensile strength of the rock uh, proportional to tensile strength because this is I1 meaning that if you get to a value lower than this the rock is going to fail but we know that also this is not exactly a straight line a vertical line but it's more or less something like that that's more realistic and this line you can find the equations for this it's called the modified Griffith criterion but in essence what we have is a limit by shear yield by tensile failure and as we saw before there is also going to be a limit for how much you can pr compress the rock for example if we don't have any deviatoric stress and we just have compressive stresses we're going to have a maximum value uh, let's say there's somewhere over here of the yield stress if we go beyond that point the rock is going to start to to show irreversible deformation in compression let's say that I have a little bit of less mean stress but also I have some shear do you think that shear is going to help the rock attain a yield state at a smaller mean stress or at a bigger mean stress so what I'm asking you basically if this line is going to go to the left or to the right I hope you see that it's going to tend to the left and the meaning of that is that when you have shear plus mean stress the mean stress that you need in order to, to get to yield is lower than the one you would need without shear so shear enhances this compaction and here we're going to have fewer isotropic loading and rock can fail because of that but somewhere over here we're going to have shear enhanced compaction this is going to be what is called all of this 
the compression yield cap. For the geologist in the room, which is just one today, I guess, here is where you get your, but there will be more online, I hope. Here's where you get your shear bands. You have a lot of compression, but you have also shear. And when that happens, the rock fails in shear, but the, gra the grains crash, uh, lowering a lot of porosity in that region. Let's see if we can find a, a nice picture about that. Before, before I do that, let me show you another picture. about that and uh, this is an example of what will happen for example when you have one dimensional strain compression you go beyond the yield limit which in this case is somewhere over here you keep on compressing you don't let the rock expand in the radial direction and you end up with grain crashing everywhere this will be mostly a type of a compression failure. This happens when you lower too much the pressure in your reservoir and so, m so that the grains start to, to crash and they start to block the pores and, and uh, some fines start to form. Let's see if we find some cool picture of a compaction band. All right, so this is a very nice schematic that shows what will happen. Uh, you have shear, but at the same time, your grains, they crash. And they crash in the localized shear region. And when that happens, uh, you get to, mm, let's see, um, if I find a nice picture about that. I did a field trip in May where we got to see some of these shear bands. And actually, I have them in a laboratory. I should have brought those. But uh, mm, this is more or less a good one. But OK, oh, this is a good one. All right. So what we see is that we have a shear failure here on the right. And in the region of the shear, this grain crashing, uh, which makes the shear failure to have a much lower porosity and permeability compared to the intact rock. You will have the opposite when you have dilation and you have grain rolling over each other. Sometimes you have dilation or you have a fracture with asperities going on top of each other, you will expect the fracture to be more conductive than the matrix. In this case, is the opposite. All right. So we're going to get to talk about this, and we're going to write some equations to let us explore a little bit better this shear yield and this comp compression yield cap. Uh, but we'll do that on Wednesday, okay? Now, let's talk about the project so you can finish that on time. Okay. Uh, project number six. Step one, you're going to have to digitize this data and get the equations for the failure criteria. And that's going to be uh, Coulomb. 
over here with the same parameters and the equations that also we saw in class you're going to have to use those to feed also Drucker Prager and you also going to have to assume a given tensile strength uh, uh, guess what going into the book Jagger's book and read look for the section the section of tensile strength and you will see that he, the, here uh, there he says or they say because several authors they say what is the reasonable assumption of tensile strength given the unconfined compressive strength okay so I'm not telling you what that tensile strength is just read a little bit of the book and you will come up with an answer for that I think up to now that should be straightforward okay uh, okay now let me do one more thing I think here Lake Cartillon okay one more Coulomb Drucker Prager and Lay modify Lay okay that's the first part which is getting the information about where the rock is going to fray step two is you have to calculate the state of stress around the Weber wall how do you do this you do it with the Q's equations you already did this for a vertical wellbore right and the procedure for a vertical well is very easy just use Q's and let's say that we have a, a vertical wellbore over here we have let's say maximum principal stress in this direction the minimum in this one according to the state of stresses the pressure in the wellbore and the pore pressure in the rock you can tell me what is the stress around the wellbore and you can tell me whether there is or not a tensile fracture and there is or not for a given wellbore pressure a breakout I don't remember we talked about this but uh, we, we could repeat this now if you have a breakout which is basically shear fractures propagating into the rock so that at some point that rock falls off uh, falls off the, the wall of the wellbore and gets into, into cuttings this angle from here to here is what is called the wellbore breakout angle and for a given pressure you can calculate that basically this wellbore breakout angle is going to be the region in the wellbore where sigma 1 is higher than UCS plus sigma 3 times this friction coefficient so here we're making an assumption which is uh, more or less okay but at some point it might break down basically we co we compute the stresses all around the wellbore and we check in which locations we have shear failure and in those locations that we have shear failure we say that that's going to be 
a breakout place and how many positions I get here, that gives me the breakout angle. For a vertical well, you can do this analytically. It's not too difficult. And here is the solution for that. Uh, this is this is the solution. That will be the angle of the of the breakout that you would get with given state of stresses, uh, unconfined compression, strength of the rock, and friction coefficient, and pressure of the wellbore minus pore pressure. So you have everything there. Uh, or uh, this will be actually the breakout angle. Or you could reverse this equation and, and tell. If I have a given breakout angle, what is the pressure in the wellbore that I need to get that breakout angle? So you can do this analytically. It's not too difficult. Basically, you have to assume failure at that point, and whatever is at failure is going to be the breakout, and whatever is not at failure, uh, it's going to be the uh, just not a breakout. Okay. So for a vertical wellbore is relatively easy. But you're going to have to do this for deviated wellbores, okay? And this is where it gets a little bit more complicated. But it's basically the, the same procedure. You have to look for where sigma 1 is and sigma 3 go over the line of the shear failure criterion. Okay, so with a deviated wellbore now, The vertical well solution, again, it's in my notes, and it's relatively straightforward. For a deviated well board, not that much. So for a deviated well with isotropic elasticity, you're going to use Kirsch plus far field shear stress. If you remember when we talked about the Kirsch equation, it was just a solution whenever you have stresses, normal stresses which are different in two directions. But we missed one component, which is shear. And a deviated wellbore, that's going to be the case because a deviated wellbore is not going to necessarily go in the direction, it's not going to coincide with the direction of the principal stresses. And because of that, you're going to have shear. So how do you solve for that? You want to have to do a little bit of coding because you're not going to be able to, sh to solve this manually. Um, we're going to have to get back to matrix, matrix multiplication. But before we get into there, we need to define what is the orientation of the well. And these are going to be basically two variables. The azimuth of the wellbore, and that's going to be the angle between the projection of the wellbore on the horizontal plane, which is going to be this line and the angle delta, and the deviation of the wellbore. Where for a vertical wellbore, deviation is zero, for a horizontal wellbore, deviation is 90 degrees. For a wellbore, let's say a horizontal wellbore that goes in the east direction, that will be an azimuth of 90 degrees. So basically, for any orientation, we can plot that into this stationary projection with a dot. Where the dot tells you in which direction the well is going. This one, for example, that let's say 30 degrees from the north towards the east, and what is the inclination? In this case, this wellbore is deviated about 50 degrees from the vertical position. And here on the right, you have an example of a deviation survey as a function of depth. So, a uh, question. 
um, what is the initial deviation of the well ball from this plot here on the right? Does it start vertical or not? You have to take a look at the at the color code in order to figure that out. So this is depth, right? And what this data is telling you is that close to surface, the wellbore starts there. So it doesn't start vertical. It starts going to the south at an angle of more or less over 10 degrees. So wh wh where is the south? South over there, right? So starts going towards the south and then gets vertical because you see that most of data points later they are at the center. So for any wellbore trajectory, you could plot that into these stereo net plots. And our objective is going to be to superimpose a wellbore deviation. That in this case, I'm not going to give you a particular wellbore deviation, but you're going to do this in general with what you should expect as a failure surface. So for example, I could have a wellbore that, let's say, starts vertical and then goes a little bit to the north and then deviates uh, towards the north-south, something like that. I'm sorry, towards the northwest. So this is the north again, this is the west. This is the east. So this would be the particular deviation uh, survey of the wellbore. Here's vertical, here's horizontal, and this is how it would go in this stereo net plot. And on top of that, we have this surface, which is telling us what is the minimum required unconfined compression strength so that wellbore would not fail. Alternatively, for example, today, what Professor Zimmerman was plotting is what will be the minimum required pressure so that the wellbore doesn't collapse, which is just changing a little bit the equation. But before we go into details again, according to this plot, what would be the least convenient orientation of a wellbore in terms of shear failure. The color code is meant to, to tell you that. Usually we have a natural perception to see everything which is red to be bad, right? Uh, so in this case, what would be the orientation of the least uh, convenient direction to treat the wellbore or the most uh, uh, mechanically unstable. Uh, and for this case, would it be a vertical wellbore? No. Uh, those would be wellbores which are horizontal and they go in the direction of SH max. And to tell you why now, it depends on the state of stress. In this direction, if actually, you know, this is my wellbore, it, it is in this plane perpendicular to this wellbore. Uh, it's kind of difficult to do this here, but uh, let me move this one down here. Uh, okay, so th this is the wellbore in this plane. That's where I have the maximum stress and isotropy because the largest, largest stress is vertical. The minimum is 
horizontal in this direction. So the maximum sigma 1 minus sigma 3 is on this plane. That's why that's the least convenient direction to drill a wellbore. I mean, I mean depends in terms of wellbore stability. That would be the one that has the highest deviatoric stress. And the one that has, for this particular example, the least will be that one. A combination of normal, a combination of vertical stress and uh, horizontal maximum for this particular case, okay? It, it, it that, that can change also if it is uh, under normal condition. Okay, so, so now that we know what these plots are, let's see how we continue. All right, so we know how to make these plots. And the next thing, uh, this, this is what I was explaining before. You can take a look at, at that a little bit later. Uh, a, a corollarium of what will happen, you know, we say what is the maximum plane of principal stress and what is the direction of that principal stress that will also dictate where the breakouts happen. In a horizontal wellbore, that depends on the direction of the horizontal stress. On a vertical wellbore, that would depend on which stress is the highest. For example, under normal faulting, the maximum stress is vertical, minimum is horizontal, so the breakouts will happen on the sides of the wellbore. If we had a reverse or a strike slip uh, stress regime, the breakouts would happen on top and bottom of the well, not on the sides. Okay, so you can take a look at that here, but this is what you have to do after that. Given a deviation and an azimuth of a wellbore, you can construct a coordinate system for that wellbore. That coordinate system is going to have its own uh, transformation matrix to go from the geographical coordinate system to the wellbore coordinate system. And we want that because we want to convert the geographical stress tensor to the stress tensor in the wellbore coordinate system. And you will do this by multiplying these matrices and if you further start from the principal st stress tensor, then you have to multiply also the matrices for to go from the principal state of the stress to the geographical uh, uh, system, and then from the geographical to the wellbore. But it's, it's all just matrix multiplication. And once you have that, you're going to have this stress tensor in the coordinate system of the wellbore. Where the coordinate system of the wellbore, the first element is, goes from the center, this is a cross section of the wellbore, goes from the center towards the lowest point of the wellbore. The second element goes from the center towards a side point on the wellbore, but it's on a horizontal plane. And the third one goes along the direction of the wellbore. That's a coordinate system of the wellbore. Okay, last step. You add the solution of principal stresses or just normal stresses for Kirsch that we had before to adding also shear in the far field and that's going to add uh, another component and your equations are going to change slightly compared to the previous one. And this is a solution. Now in terms of the radial stress, which is still the same because mud pressure does not apply here on the wall of the wellbore. The hoop stress, which if you remember, we had this component theta, but now we have another component which is sine of two theta and a far field shear stress. And now also we have a component which is, we can have shear 
not on the face of the wellbore, but perpendicular to it. And this is, I don't know if I have a drawing about this. Okay, no, no, let, let, let me do it. So we know what sigma RR is, we know what sigma theta theta is. Uh, let me do it over here. Okay, this is the wall of the wellbore. And I have an element uh, somewhere in here. We know what sigma RR is. We know what sigma theta theta is. But what this is telling me is that, well, also we have sigma CZ. What this equation is telling me is that sigma RZ is going to be zero, but what is not going to be zero is this stress, which this is going to be sigma theta Z. or as it says in the notes over there, tau theta c, same thing. Okay, now because we have a shear stress in this location, and, and remember this is caused because the principal stress is not in direction cc, it's at some angle of cc. That's why we have an additional stress there. The result of this is that now sigma cc and sigma theta theta are not going to be principal stresses anymore in the general case. So you cannot use sigma cc and sigma theta theta in the equations of shear failure because they are not principal stresses. So out of this, sigma r is going to be, but this not. So from here, you wanna have to compute according to that stress tensor, the eigenvalues, which are going to give you sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three. And now with those ones, everywhere around the wellbore, you can tell if this is a shear failure or it's a tensor failure. Basically, what you're going to have to tell in your algorithm is you're going to tell you're going to have to tell it check whether the combination of stresses is beyond shear failure, or check if sigma three is lower than the tensile strength. That's that's what you have to ask. And there is one more thing to notice over here, since now sigma cc and sigma theta theta are not principal stresses anymore. That means that your principal stress is going to be rotated, and it also means that if you have a tensile fracture in this case, it's not going to be aligned with the direction of the wellbore, but it's going to be at some angle. And usually when you have this type of tensile fractures in wellbores, they appear like this. Like, uh, what is called uh, an echelon fractures or like uh, staircase sort of uh, fractures. And why? Because now the minimum principal stress is in this direction, perpendicular to that. So if sigma three is smaller than the tensile strength, it's going to break like this. Okay, but uh, probably I, I didn't tell you exactly how to to get there. This is kind of the final thing that you have to do. And also you have to get to check for failure uh, around the wellbore. But if I were to do that, uh, this is what I would do, like the, the workflow. You need to compute this surface for all deviations 
uh, I'm sorry, for all azimuths, for all deviations, right? So what I would do is, I would say, uh, let, let me check again what we call here as deviation and an azimuth, okay, delta and phi. I would write the loop, which is for, let's, let's just make it general, for delta uh, from zero to 360 degrees, and then for deviation from zero to 90 degrees, and at every single of those wellbores that is going to cover that uh, full uh, surface, I will calculate this, uh, let me go down. So you call these equations, you can do this. You can calculate, oh, there is one more loop, there is one more loop here. And I'm going to go around the, the wellboard, and let's call that angle, uh, let's call it alpha. For alpha from 0 to 360, and that, that would mean around the wellboard, you calculate sigma r, r sigma theta theta, sigma tau z and sigma cz, all from that equation that you see over there. From those, you calculate sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. And then you ask your algorithm whether there is shear failure, yes or no, and whether there is tensile fracture. And just to make it simple, what I suggest is that you break this for loop into one degree increments. So basically, around your wellboard, you, if you divide this in one degree increments, let's say this is one degree, You just check which of those are a failure. And let's say this is a failure, this is a failure, this is a failure, and this is a failure, but these are not. Then you add up all of these divided by, by the, the angle, or if you do it in increments of one degree, you're going to get that straight. This is going to be your breakout angle. And that's it. That's all, all of what you have to do. It just it gets a little bit more complicated when you have to calculate stresses around the wall of the wellbore and then have to compute principal stresses. And, uh, well, actually, I mean, you can compute principal stresses with, uh, with eigenvalues in uh, the mathematical software that you use, but also these equations are going to allow you to do that because it's just principal stresses in, in a plane, so it's relatively easy. And after that, you're going to be able to plot these surfaces that uh, tell you what the breakout angle is or what the UCS required is for all orientations and a given state of stress. And that's it. So, Again, this is going to take you some time. If you need help, let me know. Uh, also talk to Chajin, he already did it. Uh, but uh, it, you, you will see that uh, once you start it, you know, when, when you get it running, then uh, changing the case is going to be very easy. Uh, one thing I just want, want to warn you is that you may not get the exact same plots as the ones 
in this figure, for example, from, from Zobac. And that's because we really don't know in this case what was uh, Sobak's color map. We don't know what yellow is. We, we probably know what red, well, it's over here, it's over here. I don't know, we, we know exactly what he did. But what I am trying to tell you is that when you go into Python or MATLAB and you make a surface plot, your color map is not going to be exactly the same as this one. So what it appears in yellow in this solution, uh, it may be green in yours. J just, just check that, okay? But uh, you should get something which is more or less similar to what you see over here. And again, what Professor Simon did today was exactly the same as what we're doing now, but with a more complex failure criterion, with a more complex calculation of stresses around the wellbore, but it's basically the same. Okay? All right, then that's gonna be everything for today. And uh, we'll continue on Wednesday talking about plasticity.